Is there anybody there? Technology. Education. Is the future. This is 832 SIPS, an education podcast. Welcome people of the internet, to 832 SIPS, please stand by for knowledge. Welcome back everybody, to another amazing sip of knowledge on 832 SIPS. This is your host, Matteo DiMiro, and I'm super excited to introduce you to our latest episode. In this episode, we talk to Chris Heidebracht and Corey Kapalik, who are involved in creating a new Minecraft edu experience. Manitowabi Aki, which teaches about indigenous Anishinaabe culture, history, and reconciliation. Minecraft Edu is an educational game world created by Microsoft based on the popular Minecraft video game. Chris is a teacher at St. George School in Winnipeg who has been using Minecraft in his classroom, and Corey is a principal at Marion School in Louis Riel School Division. Both were involved in the creation of this lesson, in consultation with Anishinaabe elder and grandmother Chickadee Richard. Join us as we discuss the experience of the creation of this lesson and how it is relevant and being used in classrooms today in Manitoba and beyond. If you guys could tell us just a bit more about yourselves, what got you into education, what was your aha moment, just a little bit about your background, and we can start with you, Chris. Sure. My name is Chris Heidebrecht. I teach grade five, six at Minnetonka School in the Louis Rial School Division. I've been teaching. This is my 10th year. And uh, when I got to university, I, I had taught drums before and I knew I kind of liked that. I coached sports, played sports, uh, but wasn't sure I was going to go into education. Um, and then all of a sudden it just kind of clicked for me. I've kind of found my passion. And uh, 10 years later, I've been just absolutely loving every minute of it. Corey, do you, do you want to do yours again, or do you want me just to reuse what you what you said before? Oh no, I could I could do it again quick here. Um, so I am a, a proud Métis father of uh, three children, um, originally from the Interlake region. My uh, my family or, originates from the Interlake region with ties to the Red River settlement. Uh, this is my twenty second year in public education. I. Um, at the age of 22, uh, began my teaching career, um, taught high school uh, technology uh, courses, taught career ed courses um, for 14 years, uh, coach football as well, and uh, love that. And then I was in divisional leadership in two different divisions in Indigenous education, and now landed at the spot of uh, being a principal of a K-8 school in Louis Riel School Division. So um, really, uh, have always been um, involved in sports. And, you know, I, I would say initially I thought, hey, this is great. I could coach basketball and get paid for it. But then there's the teaching part, right? But absolutely just uh, super excited about all the opportunities that I've had. And, and, you know, with projects like this in front of me, I've, I've really enjoyed my career. Awesome. Yeah, actually, uh, I share a similar story to both you gentlemen. Uh, you know, myself, I got into Minecraft a little bit too, and I'm using it in my class and my math and my social class. So I'm super excited about chatting with you guys today about it. So I kind of know how my journey worked out, but uh, how did you guys get started with your journey with Minecraft? Maybe Chris, you do you mind sharing how how you started to throw the blocks down? Yeah, so I'll uh, throw the blocks down. Nice. <laughs> so it's kind of funny because I had never played Minecraft myself. And at the school I was working at before, it's called St. George absolutely amazing school with an incredibly diverse population. Like we're talking about 50% of the students EAL, English additional language learners. So I had one student who kept on talking to me about Minecraft, Minecraft, you should try this game, you should play it. And he's like, we could do it at school, we could learn stuff using Minecraft. And I'm thinking, okay, I want to hook this kid, I want to get him into the class. So I kind of start looking into it. And right away, using the blocks as math manipulatives, thinking about 3D shapes, seeing some artistic things in there. I'm like, you know, I could see this kind of working. So the student, I actually give him the curriculum documents. It's like my first year of teaching, right? I'm thinking, okay, what are we going to do here? I slap these huge texts in front of him and I say, circle what you think we can do. 
And he comes back and he's got like amazing plans for what we can do with Minecraft. So at this time, of course, you can't get it on any of the computers in the division. It's just, it's not accessible. So I pitch my vice principal and my principal, Jason DeBow and Barb Schwab at the time. And they're like, I'm on board. I'm in. So we talk to the division. The next thing I know, I've got 20 iPads in my classroom, which was amazing uh, with all Minecraft pocket edition on it. And away we went. It was just like, I mean, a little bit of a secret. I'm still terrible at the game. Like I, I am not a good Minecrafter, like seriously. And if any teachers are out there thinking like you have to know what you're doing to try this with your kids, like you don't like my kids run the show. They help each other. I'm like, how do you fix this? They're like, Oh, Mr. H click here, click there. Like that, that's been my entire journey. And uh, yeah, it's pretty special for me to think back on what I think is so important for student engagement was really started by one student with this idea. How about you, Corey? How about how did you get tied into the Minecraft? I started with Minecraft a little bit when I was teaching high school. I was teaching computer science, and I had one section of grade 10 computer science when I started. So I talked to my principal at the time, and I said, you know, we need to add some appeal to this course or what have you. So the course sort of became sort of focused on on gaming, right? And 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 producing apps and and doing things that we can do. I know that we we did some work with uh, uh, Kodu, uh, the Microsoft programming language, and uh, the kids were into Minecraft like back then, and they loved it. So we we experimented a little bit, and now, you know, <clears throat> fast forward. 20, 20 years and, uh, you know, working in the role of um, inclusion specialist and in Indigenous education, starting to think of ways that I can engage the students in my community. Um, my school, there's approximately 60% uh, Indigenous students and 20% and newcomer and, and really an unfortunate culture of poverty. And so um, a lot of my students aren't getting involved in uh, sports teams and, and, and after school programming is tough. So kind of the goal this year and, and being inspired by, by Chris and Mark Lesiak, uh, also within the Louis Riel School Division, is finding ways that I can engage my students in, in healthy ways. We also started an esports club, so that's been very good too. But teaching students how to work together, teaching students how to collaborate, um, really hard when you tell a group of four or five students when we're creating something in Minecraft or, or working within Minecraft that, you know, Chris is the project manager for today. So let's see how this works, right? But just the skills and, you know, as Chris said, if you need any help, uh, go to your students, right? Um, and I think it's a unique opportunity, especially in diverse school settings where Minecraft is a language that all students speak. And um, it's, a, it's a way in which we can engage in an activity, in a school activity, in something that students are proficient in, but also that I could bring my own worldview, I could bring who I am to the game of Minecraft because I've already established that I, I engage in this game and the way I do. And um, then Christian Michelek, who is our superintendent, uh, approached a few of us about an opportunity. He met um, I think it was Aria and Susie, Chris, I'm not sure, but there's a few, um, a few members of a, a, tech, a Microsoft conference in London. They started talking about indigenous languages as part of all Microsoft suites. And the conversation kept going. Next thing you know, we're all sitting in a room talking about what this could look like. What could it look like to build a game that's representative of uh, Southern Manitoba, indigenous culture and the Anishinaabe. So Really a full circle thing, but um, uh, very exciting. I was just going to jump in there. Like, I think one of the cool things that LRSD has done is create an ed tech mentorship program. So we they, they find teachers who have an interest in uh, an area of technology and then create cohorts of other teacher learners who want to work with that teacher and learn. So we started with the Minecraft EdTech cohort a few years back. And now it's Mark and myself that are the EdTech mentors. And so we'll take cohorts of 10 to 15 teachers and we run different sessions throughout the course of a year. So we actually start in the new year in January so that everybody can kind of 
figure out Minecraft and get comfortable with it. And then the real meat of it is when they start their next school year in September. They have summer to think about it. They have summer to think about how they might unit plan, where they might incorporate it. And that's kind of the real goal is for people to feel confident with it when they roll out their new school year. And so what the program looks like is your traditional come to a meeting room. We run through the clicks. We show you some sample lessons. But where it's really special is the teachers then, I mean, before coronavirus, uh, would come to my classroom and hang out with my students and watch them play. And then the group would go to one of the other cohort members classrooms and see them unroll the game. And so it's that like sustained professional development with a network of people that you connect with that allows someone to take a risk with something like Minecraft and try it with their kids. And I think that program is just amazing from my perspective of, of how you actually see people use PD instead of just learning about something and then tucking it away. And uh, I think too, like part of the, the selection of LRSD to partner with Microsoft in this was that we kind of had a foundation of not just using Minecraft, but really understanding how to incorporate it and make it useful. Like, you know, I'm a big advocate for making sure you use your time well with students. Like we, we have to have them achieving. And there's so many amazing things about Minecraft. You could just throw it on at the end of the day and let them play. But that's what they're doing at home anyways. Like let's drive instruction. Let's, let's drive purposeful activities. Let's structure meaningful group work. And so I think LRSD really has done a good job of making sure that that's how Minecraft has been used. Yeah, that's a great way to loop in teachers. I like that idea of, um, you know, having them see other people who are experienced play. Um, so, and just to get a sense of some of the time scales here, because you guys mentioned meeting in L London originally, um, what, like, what was it like developing Manitoba Abia Key, uh, the Minecraft world? Uh, Chris, do you want to start? Yeah, so I think after, uh, we'll call them the big wigs, met in London, they came back home to Winnipeg and uh, then started to assemble the team. So that's when I kind of jumped on board. And that was, that was like in the fall of uh, two years ago. Like, I think we're 13 months into the whole process start to finish, but the idea was planted even before that. And so right away, basically the first question was, can you think about what this world might look like? Can you think about how we want to design it? And so I kind of started thinking and right away when the team got together, there was really only one word that came to mind. And that was like, we need to listen. Like we're making a world that's going to represent something really sacred to people. And that's where we start. We start by listening. And so the team first got together at Marion, Corey's school, and we just started listening and pitching ideas. Um, and then once we put together knowledge keepers that we were going to uh, incorporate into the game, and once, of course, we had the outstanding Chickadee Richard, who I think really drove this entire process, um, we, we were able to get running with it. Corey, do you want to add to that? Yeah, I could jump in if that's okay. <laughs> like, you know, when we're doing something that we knew was going to get some legs, right, and we knew that there was going to be um, – there was going to be some attention brought to it, you know, in, 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 in Canada and, uh, you know, now internationally, we're learning that this world is being used in incredible ways, but um, very important to us was that we're not bringing in uh, knowledge keepers, elders, grandmothers, grandfathers at the end to give it the stamp of approval. And very important to us is that we don't deviate from, from that. So we have a council of grandmothers and grandfathers in Louis Rail School Division representing uh, the five Indigenous groups of Manitoba, and we pitched it out to them and said, hey, we're not doing this unless, you know, we're doing this with you. And uh, I was super amazed with the progressive nature and thinking of the elders and knowledge keepers that we work with, and, and they're like, wow, this gets culture presented to kids and, and in, in, in such a way, in such a dynamic way. Um, you know, I, I wouldn't say that our grandmothers and grandfathers are all sitting at home playing right now, but they we they we immerse them enough into the game that they could see the potential and the possibility. Originally, we were talking about let's do let's have a landing spot and you choose a linguistic group within Manitoba, and then you get to go there and explore. But very very quickly, we saw that there's no way we're going to be able to do justice to 
you know, five very unique, distinct nations. So the idea then was to begin with the Anishinaabe because regionally to Winnipeg, that is the traditional territory and they were the treaty signatories. And then Chickadee was um, the member of our grandmother's grand, grandmother's grandfather's council who is Anishinaabe. And she came on board and like right off the bat, it was nothing happened without Chickadee. And she was part of the development team. And, uh, just amazing how she shared her her gifts and her knowledge with us and really got why this is important, really got why it's important that we teach students about the sophistication, the health, the, the thriving communities that existed prior to contact and, and not just to teach students the abruptness of colonial, colonialism, but also to teach students that this is a, a beautiful culture full of sophistication and yeah it looks different than it did in Europe at the time but but you know really battling against the idea that there was nothing here and and also that you know um, this way of life still exists to this day and so um, Chickadee was instrumental she brought in um, a number of other knowledge keepers uh, Isaac Murdoch is our is our star power in all this and and he does work he did work in the game around around constellations but if there's anything I could emphasize and, and recommend for anybody engaging in, in a project like this, this project is about reconciliation, but also this project is an act of reconciliation. And so if we're doing this without those who the knowledge and stories belong to, then, then we're off, right? And the last thing we wanted was to have an appropriated world here or, or something that might offend people. And, um, just one more piece of that uh, is that, you know, our superintendent Christian Mishlick gave us permission that at any time, if this isn't feeling good, if any time this is going down a road that we're not feeling good about, we're out. And so we just started in a good way with Chickadee and, and the rest, as they say, is history. That is, it's just so important that we have that representation at the table, that they're part of, of building and, and creating those worlds. So, Thank you for sharing that. Um, I think that leads into or into our next question here. Um, so what are some lessons, surprises, or unexpected events that happened while developing this world? Um, Chris, what are, you, what are your thoughts? Yeah, so I think these, connect, these questions kind of connect. Like, for those of you who aren't familiar with the game, uh, it's designed in three phases. So in the first phase, students uh, spawn at what is now the Forks. And so they'll receive teachings from NPCs uh, at the forks, and then they head off to a second phase, which is uh, exploring the Petroforms, an area in the white shell of Manitoba, and a really sacred place uh, to the Anishinaabe community. After they're done the Petroforms, they head down the river to phase three, where they'll take part in a bison hunt, and then establish their community. So the reason I'm laying it out like that was when we, when we first showed Chickadee, the version of the game, like a very early beta test. We had phase one and phase three. And Chickadee said, we need to go to the Petroforms. And so right away, the team is thinking, okay, we need to make the Petroforms in the game. And Chickadee's like, no, we need to go to the Petroforms. And we were like, okay, we're all in. And so I think it was maybe a week later, we're in the car making the hour and a half drive out to uh, you know, the white shell to, to see and to experience the sacred land for ourselves. And I think that perspective changed for me when I was starting to experience things as a team member, when I was with spending time with people, building friendships, talking. And in that moment, I think I saw the bigger picture of the game. And we came back uh, called Microsoft on our next meeting and said, hey, guys, uh, we're going to add a whole new phase to the game. And Microsoft, you know, throughout the whole process has basically been like, yes, 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 we're here to help. Let's make it right. And so, like, the game took a huge turn. Like, I think we added 33% more to the game in one day, um, but it was important. And that's the title of the game now, right? So, so. Manituabi Aki, the place the creator sits. Like that's that's the heart of it, and uh, that that was kind of an interesting experience, I would say. 
Yeah, I think for me, because I have children who have been involved in uh, Minecraft, I have a 12 year old son and a 16 and 18 year old daughter now. And they, my 16 year old daughter and her friends still build on worlds that they've been building for years, tons of fun. But um, so, so being familiar with Minecraft and then seeing what uh, Microsoft was able to do for us in terms of the trees, right? The, 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 poplar, spruce, cedar trees, the water. I think that's one of the most amazing parts about it, just to see that we put in the the, the muddy waters of the Red and Assomboyan rivers into it. So that was super, super cool um, for me to see. Um, but I think the, the thing that, uh, like prior to this, Chris and I knew each other. Um, Mark and I knew of each other. Um, the team came together in, in, in such a way that is, is hard to explain. Um, I think we all felt when this project was over a sense of relief, but also a, not a sense of loss, but a sense of, hey, we're not coming together two, three times a week anymore. And to see um, those non-Indigenous teachers uh, who, who were involved and to see the way um, Chris and Mark and, and Greg Kiesman, who's, um, who's a uh, coordinator within the division with uh, technology, but just to see how groups of people can come together and work on a project together and share our stories and share our experiences with each other. And, you know, at the end, there was a star blanket ceremony um, for, for Chris, Mark and, and Greg, who, who really came into this with an open heart and an open mind. And then, so for me, thinking about this as an Indigenous educator, just to see how powerful um, collaboration, how powerful bringing in knowledge keepers, not just for game projects, but but bringing knowledge keepers into into what we do, right? And um, so in the end, um, you know, I've said it before, the act of reconciliation in us coming together um, a group of people from several walks of life, a group of people with uh, different worldviews, perhaps, and uh, just working together and creating something for the benefit of, of the children. You know, I think about my kids in my school who, who are Indigenous and, and how many times do you get to be an Indigenous how, often, how many times do you see an Indigenous character in a game that's, that's the central focus point? So um, long-winded, I know, I apologize, but just, just the, the whole piece of the human spirit and, and, and working together. And, um, you know, I know if you'd ask Chris and Mark and Greg, um, this has been a life-changing experience, I, I believe. That, that's amazing. I don't. I have a similar story, not to the extent you guys have, but we have a knowledge keeper at our school. I live in Treaty Four territory, and uh, our knowledge keeper talked to their students, and we built uh, like a Cree in the Walk. I think hopefully I'm saying Cree properly um, village, and and he was just totally amazed. And they took the, his his knowledge and put it in the game, so it was authentic. And just to see how those kids built with that, and saw that our knowledge keeper was really. Uh, he was really impressed with how they did it and how they were respectful and all that and how other kids learn from those kids. Yeah, it's very powerful. And I just, just to have that worldview uh, happen is just, just outstanding. So I just loving this conversation this morning. It's really, really powerful. Um, so this has been obviously a, a smash success, but is there any other ways you'd probably use Minecraft in your classroom? I know, Chris, you mentioned a little bit of those math manipulatives and stuff too. So that's something that I do as well a little bit, but is there some other ways you'd like to see this go, either the project or is there something else with Minecraft that you would like to use in your classroom? How much time do you have for this one? Uh, yeah. uh, me, me forever. I love talking. This, this is awesome, but <laughs> we talk well, about another podcast too. Yeah, we could do another podcast if you want, and I could do a, a real rundown of uh, some of the cool things I've seen people do and, and some of the things I've I've tried to do myself. But I'll, I'll guess I just get to, to one very quick example for teachers out there. Like if you have an assessment checklist, so what you're looking for the student to demonstrate, and I'll use an example. Recently, we were studying 3D shapes. So in math, we were doing a little bit of like area, perimeter, volume, um, surfaces, edges. And so you basically just make a list of what the student needs to demonstrate and then follow that up with like a show me what you know. So here's what you need to show. How can you show it? 
And in that, in that instance, I, it is not a Minecraft assignment. Like not everybody has to go do this on Minecraft. They could pick whichever way they would like to do the project. But you're, you know, in my experience, you're going to get probably 80% of your students who choose Minecraft. They, they just love it. I mean, some kids built little cities, some kids built massive buildings. Um, the most spectacular experience for me was one of my students built a drawbridge and I was like, I don't think this is going to work, buddy. And he's like, yeah, like it's going to work. And I'm like, well, yeah. you, you need to have a shape to it. Like it can't like, it, you know, you need to show it. So he's working on it, working on it, working on it. And then he finds this thing called a construction block. You ever seen this before? It like creates a 3D uh, shape of the space that your object takes up. And it's got the Y, X and Z axis and it's got the numbers on it. And he shows it to me. I'm like, this is perfect. He calculates everything, uh, lists all his vocabulary words, points it all out, and away he went. He just crushed the assessment. And so I think looking for that, like, show me what you know statement and, and allowing kids to understand what the criteria is and then figuring out for them how they're going to express their understandings. And that allows for, for the creativity piece of Minecraft. That allows for some collaboration. But then at the same time, you have a very clear list of objectives that kids are working on. Perfect. Yeah, and in my school too, we've started off by incorporating passion project time for students. And so it doesn't have to be Minecraft with those students who would like for it to be Minecraft. I, you know, find time to get away from the emails and reports and roll up the sleeves and work with kids. And, and it's amazing. Um, we talk a lot in that time about audience and purpose. So like, let's make something. And if we make something in Minecraft, who is this going to benefit? How is this going to be used? And um, uh, I have a group of young men in my building uh, right now who um, I think we all know the kids who sometimes need an opportunity to not be in class or, or need a break. And so what we talked to them about <clears throat> with uh, doing and, and just one of the projects that, that, that they came up with, and it's amazing, is that they're making a to scale version of um, our school. And so there's tons of learning in there. Right. And we have those old one foot by one foot blocks, all uh, tiles all throughout the school. So we spent a ton of time measuring and scaling. But to me, what was most valuable to that whole experience is that the student's idea is that when a new student comes to the school, they want to send them the world and they could figure out where their classroom is, where the office is, where the gym is ahead of ever stepping foot in the building. So you start to think about uh, curricular connections, but we also, you know, think about areas. How can we help students? How can we help others? And it really is endless. Um, and, and once you have that crew, who's your Minecraft crew, like watch out, right? Now I'm just trying to keep up with them. And I think I'll, I'll jump in on that word endless. You know, if I'm sharing any tips from my experience, that's one of the things that happens is that things do become endless. And as a teacher, you, you have to be aware of number one, how much screen time you're comfortable with your kids getting and how much time you're, you're willing to commit to really with like kind of one medium. And, you know, the second thing is the options for Minecraft are endless as well. Like if you check out the Minecraft education website, the content is just coming and coming and coming sustainability, equity, math, science, history. Like there is so much amazing stuff on there. And what I think like about what they're doing is they're packaging things in a way that a teacher can say, all right, I can try this. It's an hour lesson. There's reading, there's writing, there's exploration. I can give it a go. And, you know, I just find from my experience, once you open that door to the kids, they just, they just love it. And so managing what you're, you're comfortable with and how often you want to do Minecraft is another amazing conversation to have because that brings in a whole lot of, of uh, you know, I think difficult conversations about, about uh, technology time and, and time away from it. So I guess I, what I'm trying to say is once you start, it is hard to stop because they just want to go and go and go. And Chris, to add on, earlier you said how it wasn't the easiest to get, you know, you know, it was tough to get a license for or get it on the iPad or whatever. And it's just, I find it's just so much easier now to download the game. And like, if you have Office 365, like we do in our division, the kids can download it at home and, you know, and then even collaborate at home, even with the distant learning that's going on too. So it's just amazing the progress the game has made and how user-friendly and using the portfolios and the book and quill and all that. I uh, just love how the game is evolved and and like you said there's so many is endless because if you have an idea you can definitely run in there so i just love what you guys are saying 
Well, and, and so I've been recently talking to Microsoft about uh, general teaching practice with, with Minecraft and they have a team put together. That's like what they're working on is amazing. Like the things you're talking about, like the book and quill feature, being able to take photos of what you've done in the game. They're incorporating way more reading and writing and typing abilities there's immersive reader in the game. You can change languages. Like what, what's happening behind the scenes to make this a really useful classroom tool is outstanding. Like I'm really, I'm just impressed with their level of commitment to education. And like, to me, it's really important that if a teacher is using Minecraft, it's really purposeful. And, and we're driving like reading and writing and collaboration and group work and I think Microsoft really gets that and they're working to achieve that for educators. And just to add a quick point to that is the accessibility now with Minecraft EDU. And we're looking at, you know, schools and, and communities and students where there's uh, socioeconomic factors involved. And, hey, jump on if you have a device, if you have an old iPad, if you have your dad's old phone, doesn't matter. You could, you're in, right? And, and uh, just the... Um, Again, like as teachers, how many, you know, I think we should be developing a lot of things alongside our students. I'm a personal believer that teachers should be open and be developing their identity and being vulnerable in front of students in that. But what a great opportunity for the teacher to say, hey, guys, help me out here. Let's do this. I, I, we need to work together and kind of flip the roles, right? Oh, Mr. Kaplan, it's so funny. You don't know how to blah, blah, blah. You know, okay, well, teach me. I need to know, right? And 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 just that, that um, uh, I don't want to call it power. Power, but that shift in responsibility within a classroom and, and students becoming the leaders, students becoming the teachers is amazing. And it's cool to see who becomes the leaders. Like that's one of the things, I mean, I've been using Minecraft for a lot of years and watching who excels is, is always kids that, uh, that find themselves in this game. And, you know, I'll oftentimes put like a tech expert on the board. Who can you go to if you need help? And I just love looking at the list of who signs up for that. And the other thing I'm sure, Corey, you've probably had experience when a student joins your classroom community and has, you know, less than five words of English and Minecraft goes in front of them and their eyes light up and then they're immediately collaborating with classmates. That's, that's special. Well, and that's what I was saying about not to be Pollyanna about it, but being the great equalizer. This is a language yeah. that all students speak. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Well, I had a student once and he wasn't maybe academically strong for lack of a better way of saying it. But when he was in Minecraft, his exact words, oh, this is my time to shine. And I'll never forget that. And that was like, okay, yeah, you know, like every, it was worth it. Every, all, everything I've learned and all that was worth it just to hear that one. It's worth it. That. That's what I was going to yeah, say. It's worth it for that one. Worth, this is my that. time to shine. That's yeah. That was that's that, awesome. That, that, make, that gives me goosebumps. A quick question though with Minecraft, I, I, I would, what I would like to do, and it's really interesting with your world, it'd be cool to have access to different like NPCs, like, non-playable characters, like the skins. Like you guys, obviously, it's cool in your world, and I wish I, there was more available of that where you could get and put the characters in, like you guys have in, in your world. Do you think that's something Minecraft will do down the road? Is that what you're in, like? It'd be cool, like if you're doing Egypt, you get the Egyptians in there and that type of thing. Yeah, I was just going to say, like, like, in the game, I think w when we created it, we realized how powerful it was to be able to, to put an NPC in the game for yourself. And so in my subsequent meetings with Microsoft, it does seem that this is a plan of theirs, that they're looking at how they can support that in the game. And, um, you know, Corey and I have some emails to people who are really opening to listen are really open to listening. So, I mean, I'll pass that message along as well to, to, to the team there and just say like, yeah, like this is what people want. They, they want to have access to that. And uh, when you have kids making their own worlds for their own projects, now that you're mentioning it, you could really see how that in NPC character interaction would be huge. So in what ways can we continue to use Minecraft as a tool to authentically represent the indigenous culture and ways of knowing for all learners. I think I think the sky's the limit. Again, going back to what I said, I think we need to be in close contact with with those uh, knowledge keepers who we have within our communities. And obviously, we understand that there's diversity of indigenous people 
but uh, not that there's one teaching or not that there's one elder with all truths, but, but let's go, let's go with uh, uh, someone known within their community as being a leader and an elder within the community. Um, because I think that this part, the skin part, the character part becomes where we really um, in, approach what could potentially be offensive to some, right? And, and that's, I think, my biggest um, um, concern. But I think uh, in, in, with, with the knowledge keepers in place, with people in place, um, yeah, I think, I think that makes it even more. Like if, if this Manitou Abbey, a key world, was generic NPC characters, it would have lost so much. And now our students get to see, they know Chickadee in game. And like you tell a group of great students, here's Chickadee in real life, like poof, like that's that's amazing, right? So, um, yeah. So just I don't know if I answered that question, but I think that it adds such a richness to the game. It adds so much, and and you know, it's if you have a way, it sounds pretty cool. So my my perspective of that is really comes from a non-indigenous educator myself, and this has been a real learning journey for me on how to teach a lot better in this area. And it's very, very important for us to, to be thinking and learning about how to do this properly. And one of the things that I learned is that I need to have less of my voice and empower more the voices of others. And so when you take a look at, for example, the world we're discussing today, when the students interact with one of the NPCs, they'll receive a teaching and maybe an activity to do. So for example, they might learn about how the sun can help you find north, south, east, and west. Attached to the NPC conversation in Minecraft, the teacher can link to a video of that NPC, the real life knowledge keeper, sharing the full story and sharing the teaching. And some of them are three minutes long. Some of them are eight or 10 minutes long. But to me, the power in this is when you, you play in the game and you get that little spark of interest, that little bit of info, but then you can follow it up with more. And after the students watch that YouTube video, maybe they might even follow it up even more. And that's when we're looking at connecting people. We're, we're looking at uh, having knowledge keepers come to the class. We're looking at field trips to visit sites. Maybe we have students inspired to take part in ceremony when they start learning about these teachings. And so if you're looking for ways to, to, to follow, um, you know, to bring this into your classroom, I think the key is to, to think whose voice are you sharing and make sure that, that you can amplify that in a good way. Well, Chris and Corey, um, thank you very much for the conversation. Before we go, I got one last question. Uh, we ask all our guests this last question. Think of it as sort of an elevator pitch or if you were to construct a quick Twitter, um, like a, a tweet on this. Um, so if there's one thing you could change about education, wave a magic wand and have it your way, um, what would you change? And uh, either one of you can jump at that one. <laughs> Uh, one thing I would change about equity, uh, about education is equity, period. Um, uh, Worldviews, uh, if there's one thing I would change, well, I guess it's two things, but essentially I, my, my dream for education would be that students come with their, with their cultural lens, with their, uh, who they are and bring that to the school. And we find ways as educators to have students with their, that lens intact, engaging with learning in a meaningful way, uh, in a meaningful way for them, and that we find ways of students celebrating each other and learning more about each other, and uh, really providing uh, all students the opportunity for a uh, education without having to check who they are at the door. I should have gone first. Corey's too smart. <laughs> I guess I would say maybe it's that time of season for me. But if I could change one thing about education, I think it would be the reporting system. Uh, I think I think every kid should be celebrated for who they are and what they are. And every kid should look at a report card and say, I'm proud of that. I'm proud of that. And to have anxiety towards any type of assessment, in my opinion, is just it's not OK, especially for our younger learners. You're here. <laughs> well, thank you, Chris and Corey, for joining us on 832 SIPs. And it's been a real pleasure. Yeah, amazing, guys. Thank you. Yes, no, that yeah, was awesome. thank you, gentlemen. Thank you for having us.
And maybe we'll connect, we'll tailgate at a Labor Day Classic one of these times if, if this all works out. I'll, I'll bring my banjo. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. We could, we could have this is 832 system. Sips, an education podcast. We hope you enjoyed this sip of knowledge. Signing off. For now, till next time. Keep sipping that knowledge.